Thank you. It's, uh, that's one of the nicest introductions I've ever heard, and I'm afraid now that uh, whatever I say is just degrading this impression that, that uh, <laughs> Anthony has left. It's, I've known Anthony since graduate school, and um, because my uh, main advisor, John Nesserode, and Anthony's advisor, John Horn, were brothers, uh, academic brothers. So we, have, we share some uh, lineage. So it's a real pleasure to come up here and uh, talk, talk to you all. And what I've put together is some recent thinking about multiple time scales as a sort of new problem that I'm going after. And um, how it, I, I'm trying to make sense of all this work which got done in the last couple of years and how that all fits together within a multiple time scale way of thinking. So it, it's a little discombobulated but I hope that we can sort of put a narrative together with it. And I forwarded this title, uh, Sounds, Animations, Tweets, and Mobile Data. And then in putting together the talk, I thought, oh no, I actually need to address each one of these <laughs> subcomponents that I uh, put in here. Um, also, this is work which is uh, supported by a bunch of different funding agencies. And I have lots of wonderful collaborators. There's on the only way in which you could do 24 papers in a year is because a lot of other people are doing production, and I want to give them credit for, uh, it's not the, my work that's being presented here, it's their work that's being presented here. Okay, so I, I am working at this interface between theory, method, and data, and uh, my mentors have talked about this as a dance, where sometimes theory leads, uh, proposes a question, and we have to go develop a new method uh, to answer that question. And at the same time, the methodologists are developing new methods that allow people to ask questions that they didn't even know they could ask before. So there's this push and pull going on. And recently, data is sending us in totally new directions because the data are providing an influence on how it is that we can ask questions or make methods. And particularly my interest, oh, so I'm sitting mostly at this theory method interface as opposed to some quantitative psychologists who sit over on the method data side. I'm, I'm really trying to match method and theory uh, together. So everything that we're doing here is sort of an attempt at trying to match those together. Intensive longitudinal data is coming in and certainly transforming the methods that we are working with. And those in turn, hopefully, are going to affect the, meth the theory. And particularly methods which I'm going after lately are differential equations and applications are broad within a developmental and uh, family systems uh, set of thinking. And everything is sort of placed within that somehow. So longitudinal study designs come in many different forms. And I would make the argument, because that's what I do, that everything is actually a longitudinal design. Even the cross-sectional study is a one-time point longitudinal design. And we can do this through longitudinal panel studies that are taking measurements every year or every six months or every two years to experience sampling, which is daily level or hourly level, and experimental studies where you have multiple trials is also producing repeated measures data. The recent advances in web, mobile, and what I put in, I added this word this morning, embedded technologies, uh, because I do believe that soon we'll have sensors placed within our own bodies. And those will be providing data in many different ways. So if you put all that together, the technology is affording us to be able to combine these different types of designs together in interesting ways. So we can conduct longitudinal panel designs that also have daily diary components in them. Or typically, even in longitudinal panel studies, people are completing cognitive tests that are multi-trial tests. And so we have a lot of data in there. And we recently put together a special issue for research and human development on this multiple time scale issue. And we went and gathered people who had this kind of data to see if there were different ways to make uh, use of it. So I, I made this slide in 2006 when I was a graduate student. And it took about five and a half hours uh, one day. And it was on the screen at APA for about 37 seconds. And the five and a half hour to 37 second trade-off didn't seem quite appropriate <laughs> afterwards. Um, so I attempt now to put it in every single talk that I give <laughs> and to leave it on the screen for as long as uh, possible. 
Each of us is studying some kind of phenomena, and that phenomena can be located at a particular time scale from this uh, milliseconds to millennia stratum. And oftentimes, there are also phenomena that we're interested in that are, have multiple time scales embedded in them. And certainly, our theoretical structures talk about multiple time scales. So this one is interesting because there are uh, th sort of three time scales embedded in here. There's physical action, which is taking place in a moment to moment, so frame to frame type of time scale. And there is also the entire action, which is the child giving the mother this bouquet, which is taking about 15 seconds. And there's also intergenerational exchange, which we could think of as happening on a much longer time scale. And all of those time scales are influencing both the momentary behavior and the momentary behavior is influencing what's happening on the longer time scale. So if this child is never giving her mother a bouquet, that's going to have a different effect on how the mother's life also proceeds. So there is bidirectional influence of these multiple time scales uh, uh, together. So uh, John Nesserode made a distinction in the early 1990s between intra-individual change, which is sort of long-scale developmental time scale change, years, decades, and intra-individual variability, short-term change, primarily characterized by fluctuations on a short time scale. So this is across hours, weeks, or across trials in a, in a task. And there are also many systems that exist where these time scales are interacting with each other. So landscape change, erosion, these are just some that we've been looking at lately. Whether there's a global climate change model as well as local uh, adjustments to that model, which are predicting whether it's going to rain today or tomorrow. Cellular chemotax is coming from biology and river flow, where the, the dynamics of the entire river are described by one set of equations, these Navier-Stokes equations, whereas the individual water molecules are described by a different set of equations, the Newton equations. And in those fields, they have really nice mathematical models where, in a sense, parameters from one model are passed to the other model back and forth. So the long time scale passes a parameter to the short time scale. The short time scale passes it to the long time scale. Our question is, how in the world do we get psychological systems represented in the same type of uh, format that's going on there? So each, each one of these circles then represents a process. And contrary to Nessero's distinction between short time scale and long time scale change and variability, it's also the case that these sort of strong shapes can manifest at short time scales. So cortisol is an example, shows a very strong shape that occurs within a day with a diurnal cycle. And there is exchange across these two different types. Borrowing from uh, Ford and Lerner's uh, developmental systems theory, we can distinguish three different types of processes, stability maintenance processes, incremental change processes, and transformational change processes, which are like uh, Piaget's stage transitions. And there are sets of mathematical models that are useful for describing each one of these different types of processes. And I've written those out here all in differential equation form in order to indicate that differential equation models as a class of equations is useful in all these different types of processes. Now, uh, in 2009, we wrote this up with the distinction of the three different types of processes. And there's also a third, a fourth one out here, which is in blue, uh, process outcomes. And this has caused a lot of consternation on my part, because we've made this distinction that you can only look at process using this stuff, and you can't look at process using this stuff. And this is the classic dispersion uh, characterizations of dispersion. So within person variability or intra-individual variability, what John would, had referred to as intra-individual variability, the standard deviation of my distribution of scores. I can't do process with that. And now, since 2009, I would like to step back from that and say, well, actually, we can look at process. And I'll show some examples later doing that. And the reason why we went after this problem was because I collected a lot of data that doesn't allow me to fit those models, and I can only do this, but I want to make statements about process. And that need 
has driven me to reconceptual, reconceptualize this. So what we said in the 2009 paper, some parts are right, some parts are wrong, and I want to convince you that it's wrong in some, in some cases. Generally, we can give labels to these. So ITY words like lability, plasticity, uh, rigidity are attached to this kind of a model, and regulation, adaptation is attached to process models as a sort of thumb, rule of thumb distinction between the construct uh, names. Generally, the models are applied slower time scale processes for those and faster time scale processes for those. And generally, that's how I'll proceed. But that's driven by the data types that we have rather than stability maintenance processes also exist at long uh, time scales. OK, so now I'll go into a whole set of empirical examples here now that I've sort of oriented you towards the frame that I have. This is data from a two-month-old uh, infant and her mother. And at this moment right here, she is stuck with a needle. And uh, she's getting inoculation at the doctor's office and starts crying madly because the, she just got stuck with a needle. And so the background here is the level of crying that the child is exhibiting. And each of the circles represents whether the mother engaged within a five second interval that particular behavior, touching, affection, rocking the child, sticking a pacifier in the child's mouth to make them stop crying. And we wanted to understand how is it that co-regulation is existing within the system with some developmental hypotheses that mothers and two-month-old infants are not as good at regulating as six-month-old infants and their mothers who have developed some sort of regulatory pattern that they can use. Now, I ended up collabor I collaborate with some artists. And so we started taking the data and figuring out, can we do data visualization with it? Can we make gallery pieces with it? Can we make music out of it? So this is the sound part of what it is that we've been trying to do. What we do is we take uh, the visualization, the data, and we attach a sound to each particular type or a characteristic of sound. So crying is going to be attached in what you'll hear to volume. And then each of the mother's behaviors is attached to a particular sound. And what we're working from is on the music side, percussion and New York School principles. And this comes from uh, composers like John Cage and Morton Feldman, where both sound and silence are important aspects of what we're listening to. And this has been really useful in thinking about how it is that our variables have meaning. And we attach a lot of verbal meaning to our variables. And can we also attach some uh, sonic meaning to those variables? So I'm just going gonna to play this so that you get an idea of the types of sounds which we're trying to do. We're trying to make a musical form and attach that to our scientific forms. Whether this is actually working or not is a thing that's going in progress. And after you hear it, I'll explain to you what it is that we're extracting out from that from the scientific uh, pr perspective. So you get a sense of how it is that this dynamic is working. On the musical side, we've gotten some coordination between there's two percussionists who are playing here and how it is that they're coordinating, matching on to conceptually what's happening in, in the data. The average pop song has about 350 notes in it, simple, a simple pop song. This data has 48 time points in it. So we have a mismatch between the complexity which we think exists in the musical world, and we demand in the musical world, and the data which we're collecting to represent human behavior that hopefully is more complicated than a simple pop song. 
So we're also learning about it from uh, the, the, this perspective. The percussionists have taken this out on tour, and they are performing this around the, the, the world now. So we've created a new body of uh, classical works, which will become famous, I, I hope, in some way. The inter-individual differences when you hear multiple of these pieces in a row is really interesting. So we have a 11-dimensional time series system, which we're representing in sound, and we can hear the difference between one dyad and another dyad. 12-dimensional systems are very hard to deal with analytically. So one of the first things that we do is we use a complicated dynamic model, in this case a hidden Markov model, to reduce my 12 dimensions down to one dimension that has four categorical states, and we look at the, pos the transition probability from one state to another. So as this dyad is moving forward, they spend a certain amount of time in this state, and then they transition to another state. And that's sort of a latent class type of analysis that's done here. And what it affords us is that we can then, so here's a representation of the model. Here I have my manifest variable indicators, and I have a latent variable, which is the state and transitions between four different types of states. Is that then we can look at between dyad differences. So now each row represents a, per, a dyad, and we can see differences in their behavior. 11-dimensional system down to one-dimensional system and between person differences. Analytically, that's elegant and everything else, but imagine the information loss that's happening between here and here. 350 notes has now been reduced to four notes. And that's a difficulty in how much behavior it is that we are uh, missing. But we can look at multiple time scales now. So here's the different rows for different dyads at two months and at six months. And visually, you can see that the, what's coming out in the analysis also is that the organization of the green is much, is much cleaner down here than it is up here. So the six months olds are getting into these sort of good regulated states faster and not transitioning back out of them once they get into those states. So, so the states both the infant and the mother? Right, yes. So, the, so the, it's a dyadic state, and the, there's four possibilities. Yep. Uh, last resort soothing is sticking something in a child's mouth, whether that's a, a blinky or a breast. Are these the same uh, dial? Yes. They're, they're, they may take a different ordering here. We've ordered them based upon this green characteristic. So, so they're ordered separately for soothing? Yes, right. Okay, so that's just one, one example of what we're doing. Now, I wanted, I wanted to qualify. I'm coming in aging. I'm coming in on, through an aging route here. And as a lifespan person, I'm working at all different parts of the, of the lifespan. But this is a paradigm, this observational paradigm of recording people, recording dyads, and coding their behavior is not something that we're seeing in the multiple time scale world yet, the way that we've usually been thinking about it. Yet there are hundreds of studies that are like this, that, that they come back two months, and we have time series data for each one of those uh, observations. We started collecting data via cell phones uh, and trying to phrase this as big data uh, in order to chase certain funding streams. And the general idea is that we can collect high density data through devices that people are carrying around with them and try to put those into a larger matrix of age differences or age progressions as we go forward. This as a collection paradigm is just taking off. In 2009, when we started this, it was really hard to do. And now there are 12 freely available applications that allow you to collect survey data via cell phones. You also have the possibility to deliver interventions on people's cell phones. And the, ubiqu the, the ubiquity of these technologies is really driving uh, a whole set of both research and startup companies, as I was exposed to at, at Stanford. Okay, so our study, Intra-Individual Study of Affect, Health, and Interpersonal Behavior. Uh, our objective with this study was to get the rich time series data which would allow us to fit differential equations in dynamic models. So 150 adults, 
uh, age and gender stratified across the entire adult lifespan. And I, I've highlighted this question because we were counseled at the beginning um, not to include this demographic question because we were dealing with an aging population. And we had one person decline to answer this question, and yet we had 8% of our sample decline to answer income. So this is not a difficult question for people to answer, and they're willing to provide this information. So I encourage you to incorporate that into your demographic questionnaires. OK, so the objective is to get time series data. And wh what we wanted to do is call the intra-individual study because we wanted to understand people's lives, individuals' lives, as they went about them daily. And they would carry around a cell phone with them for 21 day stretches, and they would report on every interpersonal interaction that they had. So we have a conversation, and then I pull out my cell phone, and I make a rating about you, the environment we're in, and about my feelings in that interaction. So this is the rich data. And working with the artists, what I'd like to do is introduce you to all of these people, because these are real people out there. And this is how it is that we did that. And these are uh, ordered by age. So my humanist artist colleagues have gotten this representation of them. And as a data analyst, I work with a little bit different representation as I put them all as dots. So here's our 150 people spread out over the lifespan. This is age along the x-axis here. And this is their average level of happy and average level of sad across the nine weeks in which we uh, studied those individuals. So at one time scale here, we have decades as a between person difference uh, time scale that we're working with. And we can, we've collected very rich data on each of these individuals. So we can zoom in here on a 49-year-old uh, female. And here are three bursts of 21 days each. And they came into the lab. They filled out questionnaires, in, which included the CESD. And we gave them a cell phone. And they carried that cell phone for 21 days. And then they came, they brought it back, filled out some more forms, waited four and a half months. And then they repeated the process, carrying the cell phone again for 21 days. Why four and a half months? I would like to be able to say that this is a very developmentally appropriate time scale on which change is occurring. But this was driven completely by the need to spend the money within a certain time period. And I needed three bursts in order to track change at a minimum. So we are now making or coming up with a bunch of theoretical arguments as to why four and a half months is the right cadence on which to be studying uh, change. But you can see differences in this, uh, her CES, CESD scores across this time. Zooming into one burst, here's happy and sad across the 21 days. We have weekdays in white and weekend days in gray. And we can see that there's variability in both positive emotion and negative emotion. And we can zoom in on a particular day, and we can see also the fluctuations in happy and sad across this time. And we can see that around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, there was a lot of sadness with some recovery by the end of the day here. And we can see who it is that she interacted with, a family member or a non-family member in, in this case. So we ha uh, Yes, in this, in this case, they were mutually exclusive. So it, it was a checklist, and they had to choose one of, they couldn't choose more than one on these items. So because I came to the birthplace or the, I don't know, the homeland, I needed to uh, incorporate this slide. And so we, we framed an analysis of this multiple time scale data using the bio ecological model. And while Bronfenbrenner didn't talk a whole lot about time, which he included in the later versions of the model, there, there can be parallels made between the different structural systems that he talks about and the time scales on which those structural systems might operate. And we've attempted to make that type of a pairing uh, here. So we've attached 
uh, at the top there on the fastest time scale a family process and when what they would what, what Brown for Baron Morris would call the proximal process and then at the weekly or the daily time scale this social calendar process would be attached to what he's calling context and mental health processes person and the aging processes time so I've managed to transform our data into the framework which they uh, presented and we can look at how it is that this process will moderate that process, how this process will moderate that process, or this process may moderate how it is that this process moderates that process. I have a whole set of hierarchical orderings that I can do for this type of uh, analysis. So to give an idea of what the data look like here, and this will come back a little bit later as well, some issues with this data. The, the analysis is a hierarchical HLM analysis of these types of uh, data streams. We see a lot of fluctuations and that's what's important for constructing these types of uh, models. So during that analysis, four level uh, multi-level model, we can see that the prototype for a weekday interacting with a non-family member is about 62 and our interest in it is, is what is the family influence on those, the proximal process influence, so the fast time scale process and interacting with a family member increases your happiness by about one Point two points on a zero to 100 uh, scale. Uh, unfortunately, it also increases your sadness by an almost equivalent uh, amount, which fits with theory in that these are the people who are proximal process is important, so they're going to affect you in both uh, directions. Now, does the weekday weekend distinction moderate this? And in case and it does, and it does such that on the weekends there is no difference between interacting with a family member or not, and yet there is a difference on a weekday. And uh, when I was presenting, putting this together at the beginning and my, the colleague in the office next to me uh, said, oh, this is when my daughter says on the weekend, I'd rather hang out with my boyfriend than you, dad. So that's sort of the influence that's going on here. But there's evidence then that the slower time scale process is moderating the faster time scale process. And we've done this with a very elegant multiple time series design, intensive longitudinal data, and the standard hierarchical linear model, multi-level modeling techniques. And we've actually published this. So it, you can put something like this out into the literature. So we've done it in an elegant way, but what is it that we have represented? The average person, not all of those wonderful individual people that you met at the beginning of this little section here. So my complaint at the moment is that we're interpreting fixed effects from our models, and those are representative of people who don't actually exist. That's not what we set out to do in this study. We set out to look at individuals' lives. OK, so we can do a little bit better. This is true. Here we have CESD scores. So this is healthier, and this is unhealthier. You can see that the slope of the lines is changing. So there is something about the personal characteristics and how they're changing over time that is moderating the faster time scale processes. And I'll concentrate here on the age one. And we can see very distinct interactions as you progress through age. So the difference between family members, so the family influence effect, the way the weekend is working on that is really prevalent among younger adults, but among older adults, they still get the family influence on the weekends. So that fits with theoretical considerations. But what have we really done there? It's kind of the average with a little tinting to it. And that's also a little bit dissatisfying. So although we spent a lot of money and we collected all of this data, our analytical techniques, the standards in the field, are not allowing us to really get at the individual processes that we're after. So this really hit me when I was doing an analysis. Uh, so at, at Penn State, there's a group that studies stress. And across the hall, there's a group that studies drinking. And so <laughs> I attempted to do an analysis of the stress and drinking. And I went into the data, and I looked for the person who had the highest coupling between stress and number of drinks. And this is an individual. And you can see their drinking behavior here, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then a 5, 5 plus. In, in this case. And we see 
that there's also stress which is going up here. And then the data stream ends. So this was a person who dropped out of our study. And we went back and looked at the reasons for dropout. The reason that this gentleman dropped out of our study was because he lost his job. And we were collecting data in real time and processing that data in order to be able to do compliance checking so that we could give people motivational reminder calls, please fill out the forms so that you can get paid. And so we were poised to be able to deliver an intervention. We have analytical models to look at these catastrophe cusp effects, discrete uh, changes. We could do person-specific analysis. I know what this person's pattern was, and I can certainly, in this case, easily detect a deviation from the normal pattern. And then we could provide a tailored intervention to that person. Good question. It, um, is it true that the, that the, the, the uh, flux increase in drinking zero um, occurred before the increase in stress? Yes, it is. Temporally, it occurs prior to the increase in stress. So he did not get stressed out until he lost his job. He didn't get stressed out by the drinking, he got stressed out by, the, but perhaps the drinking was quelling whatever the stress was. We don't know. But I could have called up and said, dude, what, what's going on? We've noticed that your pattern has changed a lot. And maybe that would have been enough to try to help in that situation. So this was disconcerting to me and it, it sent me off on a very arduous trek, which we'll, you'll get to see some of uh, here and how it is that we went from, from there. Okay, so conceptually, what does this look like if we can deploy such a system in the real world? So here's our hipster uh, out and he's sitting, sitting on a bench and he pulls out his cell phone and he starts making some reports. And this could be done through a variety of different sensors that exist now. And he's giving us information on his physiology, giving us information on his feelings. And those little red lines that you see there are what the system has learned already about what this person's threshold is. So we sort of have a magic threshold that's been identified from their previous patterns on when it is that there's a flag that needs to be raised. So in this case, feelings got over this flag. And what's happening in the background, and this is where I started working with some colleagues in computer science to develop all of these systems that do this. And this is actually much more complicated than is depicted here. But basically the data gets sent over to the server. The server then is cranking through this model and I've represented it here as a person specific state space model currently. And it's developed a intervention that is time sensitive and context sensitive to deliver to this person. That hopefully will adjust in that particular domain which is needed at that moment. And I would say currently there are at least 12 startups that I know about that are working in this space, and I happen to be, full disclosure, consulting for one of those startups in order to create this type of uh, system to deliver uh, coaching online in a per person-specific, personalized uh, way to do that. So uh, the whole system might look something like this. This, I think, has been worked out pretty well. I gave up on sensors very early, realizing that the computer science and engineering people are moving way faster than I can ever keep up with there. Data archiving is pretty well worked out. You'll see some of our data visualizations. That's done. The data mining, modeling, and adaptive guidance pieces, that's the hard part. Certainly places like Target and Google, Facebook, are doing a lot of the data mining work currently. Less people are working in this area here. And certainly in providing interventions and delivery, there's a lot of places that are working on that piece now too. So we're going after this piece uh, in here in various different uh, ways. Okay, so person-specific approach. Now I just went through a convoluted way of showing you videos and blurred pictures in order to destroy the mean. They, uh, somebody approached us recently who's writing a book called The End of the Average, and they got um, a very large advance to write this book. So certainly people are already thinking in this uh, direction. And my colleagues and I are at Penn State, uh, Peter Muller has written a manifesto on the person-specific approach 
which is saying that actually we don't need to worry about inter-individual differences. Each person is a unique individual and they should be treated as a unique individual. So primary consideration of within-person processes and not concerned with uh, between-person differences. So what, where does this lead to if we actually try to do that? And so I'll give an example here from a family system uh, and how it is that a family system changes at multiple time scales. So the biologists uh, for, over, for almost 100 years now have been developing a set of what are called the Locavoterra equations to talk about population changes between types of animals that interact in different ways. So this interaction occurs in a predator-prey type way. This is a fish that eats, the, the shark is a little messy eater. So this guy hangs on and eats the remnants of the shark's uh, feedings. And here's a mutualistic arrangement between a flower and a hummingbird for pollination and for food going on simultaneously. And these can all be described by various sets of these types of equations. One thing to note is that the biologists are in a similar data situation. So the model for hares and lynxes is a single time series that has 100 years worth of data in it. So it's the same problem in a person-specific world where I have a single time series with lots of time points in it. So the biologists have worked out a lot of this uh, already. Borrowing from family systems theory, there's a, a couple of different ways in which we can do this. I've chosen a few here that are convenient. We have organized hierarchical interdependent structures or what I would call coupled systems. So I have multiple variables that are working together. In this case, example, a husband and a wife. Nonlinear dynamics and stability maintenance in that there is a homeostasis and the couple as a dyad is trying to return towards this homeostasis as a basic organizing principle. And then a disruption may occur, and in this case it's gonna be a child which uh, joins this family system, and it's a transformational change. So the way in which the family returns to homeostasis, we're gonna look at whether that differs before the child was born and after the child was born. Everyone knows, yes, of course. That this is the case, but analytically, can we uh, actually go after this? Okay, so borrowing from the um, mostly biology literature, although I did want to highlight, or I think I highlighted on the, on the next slide. So we can write out the mathematical equations, and we can attach substantive meaning to each one of those parameters, and I'm a big fan of this in that the equation needs to be written in such a way so that I have a direct way to translate that onto my substantive constructs. And the model has a lot more value if that is the, the case. So resistance to change or regulation of that change, a steady state is the homeostasis where this is going to, and we need to have some theory of the reciprocal relations and be able to write those into a mathematical form. Formally, they're called these influence uh, functions. And I was at Stanford and I had lunch with uh, Ewart Thomas, is a mathematical psych guy there who invited me to go to lunch and then to give a lecture in his course. I think that was my payment for the lunch, but uh, anyway, and he, he said, oh, biology models. I remember doing something like that in the 1970s. Go look, go. So I went and looked it up and 1976, Thomas and Martin in Psych Review have a paper where they, they look at this equation for mother-child dyads. Now, I had just received a grant, an R01 from, from NICHD, to apply this equation to mother-child dyads to look at co-regulation, the stuff that I showed you at the beginning. And I didn't know about Thomas and Martin's paper, and I felt so bad about that, that it was a reminder that we have to look back in the literature a little ways to see what's happening. Now, analytically, we have a lot more tools that we can apply now and the data streams now that we didn't have in the 1970s, so we can still make some advancements on what it was that was done there. Okay, so we've applied this particular equation to this data. We're gonna have some adaptive self-stabulation in the pre-baby phase and some self-organization and that the way the system does the self-stabilization will differ in the post-transition uh, phase. Now notice that I have multiple time scales going on here because I need time series data in order to watch the stabilization process 
and I need a longer time scale data in order to be able to see how that stabilization process changes over the long term. So this is what the results came out to be. And I, I find this very difficult to interpret. And that's a problem that methodologists face, is that we really love these numbers and we attach a lot of meaning to these numbers. But unless we can translate those into a way which is consumable both to a wider scientific audience and a general public, we can't have that much. Our influence will be better if we can do it in a different way. So working with the artists, I'm going to bypass this really boring black and white chart with a lot of numbers in it and try to show you how it is that this might look like. OK, so this is in the pre-baby phase here. Stylish in their clothes. And they're at a homeostasis here. So here's our mathematical pattern. These are predictions made by the model. First, they begin in homeostasis. And they're going along in their homeostasis normal life. And then an event happens, an external influence that comes in and disrupts the system, makes her very happy, and makes him very sad. So they've been pushed in extreme opposite directions. And then we watch how long it takes for them to return to the homeostasis state. And in this case, it takes three time steps for them to return to the homeostatic state. So if we go now to the post-baby piece, we can see how it is that this system looks then. So here we have our happy couple again. They have their little child. And they're going along in the homeostasis. The same way, everything is the same. So this is an assumption of the way in which we're looking at the system. The event happens again that drives her into the very happy state, him into the very unhappy state. And we watch how long it takes for the system to return back to homeostasis. And in this case, post-baby, it takes seven time steps for them to do this. So we can see that the way in which the dynamics of the system operate has now changed with the introduction of the baby into the family system. I've only analyzed one dyad, but I can make a lot of statements now about the way in which family dynamics occur. So I've adopted a person-specific approach in order to learn something about how the system operates. I really have to say working with the artists has been wonderful in figuring out well-designed ways in which to present results which otherwise would be black and white tables that are uninteresting. I encourage you to try to find ways in which to do that, too. OK, now what, what's wonderful about this is not understanding one particular diet, is that we're trying to affect human behavior and how it is that it progresses over a wide population. So our thinking is that it actually is scalable now with the technology. We have big data collection paradigms. We have big data delivery paradigms. Every person in this room, I am quite sure, owns a cell phone and carries that cell phone with them on a basis. And if you leave your house without it, there is a high desire to go back to the house and get it and take it with you. So this provides a way in which we can deliver interventions. And certainly that will the technology will change, but the idea is, still, is already there. The analytic systems and the computational speed exists that we can do adaptive analysis uh, very quickly and in an automated way. And in many ways, this is already getting deployed in what we might call adaptive gaming, that a lot of games are already working with feedback. And the game characters are changing their behavior based upon the data which they just got. So it's a bottom-up approach to deal with uh, inter-individual differences. First, we do the analysis person by person. And then we look for typologies and how this organizes on between person difference. If you, if you push this, and we can talk about it in the Q&A if it's of interest, is that I think that if you, if you take this to the extreme, the entire concept of generalizability actually may become defunct. And I know that's a big statement, but I'm playing with how it is to talk about that and whether that's a direction in which we can uh, go in. OK, so. Uh, we developed this technology, and it's quite deployable in many different places now. So this means that you can do quick launch of new studies. In our case, it takes about three weeks between the, the time that you conceptualize the study, that you can deploy it out into the field. Graduate students are really good at this. And there are now infrastructures that are developed to help you out 
with this. And you can develop APIs um, so that you can get real-time access to the data streams. So here's one where it, de it delivers you a data file on a constant uh, basis, and you can just query that data and analyze it. So a quick launch of data analysis. So then the question becomes, how is it that you can deploy the interventions out in real time? And that is also now relatively easy. This is a study I was involved with, with uh, Karen Herker and Ron Matoyer, who's an engineer at uh, Oregon State. And this is a 100-day daily diary study where they never met the people. It was all done through the web, and they got wonderful, beautiful data. And they delivered visualizations of the data. Ron Matoyer is actually interested in info infographics to show them those data and see how it is that the viewing of the visualization would affect the behavior, uh, working towards some social and health goals. Our own data, we've worked with artists to come up with representations of that data that are beautiful. And in some cases, these are now hanging on gallery walls. We're charging a lot of money, a lot of money for these uh, that are participants have produced the data which goes into these representations. The key point is that when they are beautiful to look at, they have a greater chance of affecting change or allowing people to add representations to their lives and make some differences. So we've also done this in the sonic space. And I'm excited about this one because I finally figured out how to sonify my data. And so I'm going to try to play this for you here. And, um, it has some visual representation as well that people might like to look at. So the startup companies are looking for ways in which they can attract buyers of their products. And one of them is by producing visualizations of the data back to the people in an efficiently designed way. So these birds up here, this is uh, affect valence, emotional valence on a high positive to negative scale. And it's going to be attached to a sound which is like this. One thing that you hear immediately is that the data are not collected at equidistant time intervals. It's all over the place. Analytically, this is a nightmare. The time series models, which I really want to use, are not applicable in those types of situations. Now, in the background here, we have the stress level, with yellow being very low stress and blue being very high stress on that particular day. So this adds a second time scale and provides a basis on which we can organize musically the sound that's, that's happening here. So we attach this to something which is like a breath. Oops. Trying to, and trying to make a human element in the way that the sonification is happening. So the data sonification world is highly run by physicists. And this was trying to bring in a humanistic element into the, the way that the data are being uh, shown here. The, this is level of anger. And it's represented visually in this way with the black on top of everything else because of the way in which we think that anger works is that when it comes into your system, it basically takes over everything. So visually, it's represented here as a sort of prominent uh, visual feature. And sonically, you will also hear the prominence of this thing. Now, I'm into techno music, and that is sort of why it is that this sonification came out this particular uh, way. And I'll try to keep the cursor on where it is that we are in the sonification.
So you all, you all heard it too, when that anger drops out, like there's a completely different feeling. And that's the kind of thing which you can hear in the sonifications that analytically we might not notice at the outset. So now we can go back and design an analysis to look at that particular piece of what's happening. What did they do on day 14? On day 14? That's where it drops out. Yeah. Yes, right. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, this, this particular one was selected on a visual, visual piece because it looks, it looks nice and on the musicality of the thing. And I haven't gone back into the data to check who this person actually is and what their life looks like. The between person differences are treat. unbelievable. <laughs> yes, right, <laughs> right. Um, OK, so pushing the intervention piece, I got a chance to work with uh, some environmental scientists and some computer scientists on how it is that we can deploy real-time intervention based upon these uh, data streams. So you can see the circular piece here is that we're trying to provide data feedback, change the behavior, and this is office workers in a mid-sized, oh, actually I have a little video which I'll use to explain the project here. As part of the Philadelphia Innovation Cluster, our objective is to figure out if we can change energy use behavior in mid-sized buildings, uh, commercial buildings. Energy Chickens is the, the, taking the idea that we can use entertainment formats like games as interventions in order to change people's behavior. And game mechanics are set up in such a way so that you get incremental rewards for small changes in your behavior. And if we can keep building on those incremental rewards, we might eventually be able to change big pieces of behavior. The game uses data that's uh, been collected by these devices that we use that are plugged into the wall. Um, which then uh, your electrical uh, device is plugged into. In the game, uh, the players are given chickens, and each chicken represents a different electrical appliance that you own. You're uh, given the task of taking care of these chickens, and the way that you do that is by saving electricity. The, the program behind will connect the energy use data from the database and check whether this person is saving energy or wasted energy. If they found that the person is wasting energy, then the chicken will become weak and then become very uh, unhealthy and even die. Um, but if you save energy and you're doing well, your chicken will start getting healthy and grow and start laying more eggs, which you can collect to, to buy uh, little hats and little shrubs and flowers to place around your farm. We're looking to deploy energy chickens in a space that's used about, by about 150 people. They'll all be playing this game, managing their chickens, watching their chickens grow. We're looking at how it is that the game can be used by companies in order that their employees are having fun while also saving energy. Okay, so he here's... Uh data from one person who had a bunch of devices that were getting tracked and there's a whole intervention which is getting deployed over time here and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on the data but it's a, a real-time data stream they're getting feedback and that is personalized to them and they have some incentives to do the behavior uh, uh, properly the results are such that when they are playing the game we see reductions in energy use in the gaming group and not the same reductions in the non-gaming group. But these changes in behavior do not persist once the game is no longer being played. And this persistence aspect of the games is something that we have to go after next. But what we learned is that this can be deployed, it can affect behavior, and now we have to figure out how to design the games in such a way so that we see greater persistence in the behaviors that are going on. OK, so there was inobtrusive data collection of those energy, the amount of energy that they were being used. That wasn't something which they had to fill out forms or anything like that. And we did this study with cell phones that we had to carry them out. That was a, took a huge staff in order to be able to do that. And I want more data more rapidly. So <laughs> we started looking at uh, Twitter as a way to get 
uh, data, and particularly emotion data. And I'm, as a person-specific person, interested in super tweeters, what I started calling super tweeters. These are people who tweet more than 40 times a day. So they're providing a lot of information on what they're doing. Certainly Facebook streams also provide this type of uh, uh, data here. And this is an interesting one because we got a little bit uh, distracted along the way. What we wanted to do is, is we take the Twitter data, we do some analysis of that data, we detect out patterns in it. I won't spend a lot of time on this. Come up with topics. In our case, these topics are sentiment analysis. So for each tweet, we can give it a score onto whether that is a positive, sen a positive tweet or a negative tweet and the extent to which that tweet is, is, is occurring. And is this a, basically a lexicon-based approach with some language processing so that there are intensifiers, the capital really, 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 that multiplies your positivity score or negativity score in that direction. So, so that's the way in which we're analyzing the data here. And my colleagues in computer science, are this is re regular text analysis and uh, taking the sentiment score. So there's a lot of dictionaries, lexicons that are built up in order to do this kind of thing, which also include the emoticons and how it is that those are uh, making behavior. So in 2011, there was this paper by Golder and Macy in Science that was talking about how it is that Twitter data can be used in order to observe diurnal, biologically driven rhythms in mood. And this, was, this is a windfall because it means that no longer do we need to uh, hook people up to all of these sensors in order to get the biological data out, but we can use Twitter as a proxy for that process, biologically driven tw uh, process. So we took our tweets and um, we were able to replicate the diurnal pattern. This is in GMT time, so for Eastern time zone you have to move five hours back. These are all people in the U United States. So in the morning we see this rise and then we see some gradual decline over the course of the rest of the day. This fits with the biological circadian rhythm type of idea. And we can look into the data and we see a bunch of different types of uh, features. And I'll just, uh, it turns out that, that there's Twitter accounts that aren't people. And so here's a Twitter account that there's no way a person can travel to all of these places within a day. So this is a corporation which has a Twitter account which is blasting from all over the US. This is a Twitter account which is tweeting on a very regular basis. This is a normal person who tweets on a sort of random basis. To give one example, there's a toaster and this toaster has, uh, at the time that this article came out, more than 2,000 followers. A very popular uh, non-person. <laughs> and it tweets two things, toasting and done toasting. <laughs> and those are the only two tweets that it ever sends out. So we don't know whether, the, whether any Twitter account is a real person or not, but we can use aspects of the data in order to try to separate out who's a, a real people use have a broader representation of language than robots do. So robots tend to use the same words at higher frequencies than real persons do. And we can use uh, basically a latent class model to differentiate out people based upon word variety. So we're doing that. We also had a bunch of undergrads go in and code accounts so that we had some ground truth on which to do this. And we can separate out people. We can separate out Twitter accounts then into real people and non-people robots. And it turns out that the robots have really good biology and the humans do not. And so the caution is that social media is great and I'm really into using this kind of data for things, but we need to be very careful on how it is that we're making inferences from these data streams to biological aspects of human behavior. So that's my cautionary tale on this one. Now that wasn't what we set out to do. We set out to do something totally different on analysis of how emotions are working among different uh, people. But in cleaning up the data stream, we ended up with this uh, problem. This is only among supertweeters? No, this is actually with the uh, entire, our, uh, our total database, which is nine months of geotagged tweets that span uh, about 2010 to 2011. No, uh, 
we, we, the, the, our ground truth data is, is separating out English speaking accounts that we are quite sure are individuals. Okay, so one thing that also comes out of this is that the data are not collected, and I've been referring to this a few times, at not at equidistant intervals. And analytically, this is becoming very worrisome to me, and it's why I have collected this large set of data, and I can't apply the models that I wanted to apply. If I assume the data are equidistant, these inter interactions that people have, I end up with this set of results for this particular person. And you notice that the coefficients are different if I'm doing unequidistant stuff. I've got the, the signs right, but I don't have the parameters right. And that, has, that compounds when you go to between person differences. So this was the process. This is a real process model, and this is a misapplication of the process model to the wrong kind of data. So how do we deal with that? So I'm interested in emotion in a two-dimensional space. Here we have positive affect and negative affect. And this is a single person, 63 days worth of data. And we can see where it is that they sit in this PANA space. And we can create a distribution of that. So here's a contour plot of where it is that, that those data are lying. And here's a three-dimensional version of it. Basically, the person lives in the hill, wherever that hill is. And now we can sort of make predictions about how it is that this will change across a different time scale. So I need one time scale of data in order to produce the person specific distribution. And early on in our 2009 paper, I had claimed we can't tell anything about this from that. But that we're going to go back on that a little bit. But this was the idea. How do we get from there? So how does this then? Microtime distribution change over the long term. So here's the island in which the people live. And we have age, which is increasing as the animation is going forward. And we can see that the island is shrinking over time. And if you look down here, the width of this distribution is getting compressed over time. So this fits with, say, socio-emotional selectivity theory that would say that we are constricting our experiences in order to be able to stay within a, a smaller space as we get older. We're prioritizing the core aspects of the space rather than the stuff that's further out. So here we went back to the beginning of young ages and going uh, forward. Now, one question that arises is, is this a measure now of the person? Is this a measure of the context? Or is this a measure of person by context interactions? What is underneath this? as we put in a paper, what's underneath this blanket? One of my colleagues saw this and they said, oh, there's a kitten under there like pressing on the blanket. Another one said, oh, there's a couple having sex underneath the blanket. And then we realized, well, actually what that is is it's a latent process, something we can't observe that's under there. And we don't really have a way around that. But the shape of the distribution may inform us one way or the other about how it is that that's working. So this is nice for low dimensional systems. For high dimensional systems where we have more than 10 variables, we're basically using network graphs and we come up with a different representation for every single person. How do I make sense of that heterogeneity? Or do I even need to if I'm deploying interventions at a personal scale? So I think that I'll just stop there and say thank you. <laughs>